Good. Uh, we'll start. Tosafists. Now, Tosafists uh, is a um, is a is a how do you say academic term for a group that are in Hebrew known as Baalei Tosafot. Baalei Tosafot means those of the Tosafot, and Tosafot is a Hebrew word, of course, also, which means additions. So, the scholars of the additions, or if you say Tosafist, it means uh, additionalists, maybe. But what does it all mean? Uh, we will explain. We shall explain. We'll go to the next slide. This is um, a class on the Tosafists. We'll start again with our last class. It ties into our last class, the class on Rashi. Uh, Rashi, we know, is Rashi, Rabbi Shlomo Yitzchaki or Ben Yitzchak, or the son of Yitzchak, or Isaac. It's all good, but um, that was uh, our hero of last class. Now, in the 12th century, starting with his students, his uh, sons-in-law, because he didn't have uh, sons, he had daughters. So his sons-in-law uh, continued uh, his work, basically. After he died, they took over his Talmud Academy, also known as Yeshiva, his Yeshiva. And, and then after sons-in-law and daughters, his grandsons. Uh, so Rashi's continuators wrote their own commentaries on the Talmud, and they're called additions. Uh, so they were additions to the commentaries of Rashi. Corrections, additions, criticisms, all these things. And additions in Hebrew, as I said, uh, the Hebrew word for that is Tosafot. I should not, um, well, we're soon gonna take turns again, yeah? Um, Rashi had, as I said, no sons. He had three daughters. Does anyone recognize this image from a movie? Before your time? This is from Fiddler on the Roof. It's a song, Matchmaker, Matchmaker, Make Me a Match. Because Fiddler on the Roof, Tavia, uh, this the famous celebrated, um, how do you call that, uh, musical, also had three daughters. Okay, so Yochavet, Miriam, and Rachel. And this is from another movie. Does anyone know this movie? Yentl. Yentl, yay. Who is this? Rachel. Hi, Rachel. Good. But you haven't seen uh, Fiddle on the Roof yet? I, I have. Oh, okay. You just didn't recognize the, the photo. Okay. This is from Yentl, exactly. So, um, and uh, in Yentl, uh, the story, is fr it's based on a story from uh, Isaac Balshevitz Zinger. Uh, but um, there's also a, a girl in a shtetl in an old uh, Jewish community whose father teaches her Talmud. Uh, so this is a bit uh, parallel. I thought the, the photo would fit the story. Rashi taught his daughters Bible, Talmud, and Jewish law. And that was highly unusual at the time. Um, and uh, and some, some very traditional communities, it still is. Tradition is actually goes that Rashi's daughters even put on, like men, tefillin every day. So I found here tefillin Barbie. Uh, okay. Rashi's daughter married prominent students, uh, prominent uh, Talmud students. And they're all, we're all students of Rashi. By the way, it's not 100% sure he had three, three daughters. Uh, some people say he had only two daughters, but I think he had three uh, because um, here is a uh, family chart. See here, Yochevet, Miriam, and Rachel. And uh, we don't know so much about Rachel. So, uh, the, 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 um, how do you say, the reports are that she got divorced. It was, it was probably not a happy marriage. And that's one son, so we don't know much about her son. It was not a very impactful uh, student. But there are um, reports that Rachel eventually uh, ended up b becoming Rashi's personal ass uh, assistant or, uh, how do you say, secretary, and that she often wrote down things that Rashi dictated and, um, and corrected some of the language. So, um, but I guess some people, maybe, I'm just guessing that maybe some people don't like the idea that one of Rashi's daughter's marriage was not successful and got a divorce. And maybe that's why they don't want to, um, that they'd say they like to entertain the idea 
that she um, that there were only two daughters, but uh, I think there there were three personally. Okay, so you have Yocheved and Rachel, we said, and Miriam. Now Yocheved's uh, children uh, um, uh, were the most impactful. One of them is called, as you see, Jacob. Jacob, see below her name, that was the youngest. The second oldest is Samuel. And he, I think I mentioned him briefly, he was later called um, Rabbi R, Shemuel, Sh, that's Rash, Ben, the son of Rash, B, and then Meir, because his father was called Meir. There's Rabbi Shemuel Ben Meir, that's abbreviated as Rashbam. And he's known as the Rashbam, uh, a very, uh, well, an impactful uh, scholar, and we're going to see more about him. And then the youngest one, his name was Yaakov, but he was uh, nicknamed Rabbeinu Tam. Our, stud, our teacher, Tam, and Tam means, could be, mean different things, but um, in any case, uh, maybe it's just from uh, Talmid Meir, I'm not sure where that, where that actually comes from. But he was also very, very influential. Now you see from, um, and then, oh wait, and then there's a, another one. <clears throat> oh, they had a daughter, and the daughter, I don't know what the daughter's name is, but the daughter, so Yochavet also had a daughter who married Samuel of Dampierre, which is a town, of course, in France, and they had a son, Isaac. He was called Rabbi Isaac, R -E, Rabbi Isaac, the Ri, so, uh, and he was also uh, influential. So, here you go. Sorry, I hope this is a bit interesting. It's a bit uh, like a puzzle, I know, I know. Now we go here to the next one. And I think it's time to read. And luckily, I'm very excited. I saw a bunch of names that I haven't seen um, in, um, in the past. And also that I couldn't give any, um, or basically because of time or because sometimes they were uh, not able to attend. But there are some names that I haven't read yet for a while. So I'm going to start with Samantha, I believe is here. Is that correct, Samantha? Yes, hello. Hi, excellent, excellent, I'm happy. So Samantha, do you want to read a bit? Yes, I can. Um, Lovely. Despite their respect for Rashi, the next generations of commentators regularly disagreed with Rashi, criticized him, and corrected him. Because they are mostly known for their critical additions in Hebrew, Tosafat, to Rashi's, to Rashi's comments on the Talmud, this group of sages called the Tosavists. Um, yeah, in Hebrew, Bale Tosafot. Yeah. The youngest, Rate Rahel, married someone by the name of Eliezer. She, we do not know much about her besides the fact that she got a divorce. Rahel worked as Rashi's secretary. When he became too old and too weak to write, Rashi dictated his commentaries to Rahel, and she was the one who wrote them down. Oh, that's no small thing. Uh huh. The middle daughter, Miriam, married R Rabbi Yehuda ben Nathan. Yehuda finished some of Rashi's commentary after Rashi passed away. It says in the Rashi commentary on Tractate Makot 19b, our master's body was pure and his soul departed in purity, and he did not explain any more. From here on in the, is the language of his student, Rabbi Yehuda ben Nathan. Yehuda was also one of the first to write additions to Rashi's Talmud commentaries. Such additions are called Tosafat. People who wrote such additions are called Tosafatists. Now, I explained that a few times in this class, so I'm assuming that the term Tosafot and Tosafist are going to stick because I mention it all the time. Uh, okay. Uh -huh. Miriam and Yehuda had a daughter by the name of Alvina, who became a teacher of Jewish law to women. They also had at least three sons, Yom Tov, Samson, and Eliezer. Yom Tov moved to Paris and started a Rashiva Talmud Academy there. Samson and Eliezer joined them and became teachers of, at that academy. You know what I really like? I like that uh, in many cases you see that women and men have uh, biblical names, but, you, uh, but when they don't have biblical names, in those days, in the Middle Ages, these, uh, these girls' names are so pretty. Alvina, isn't that just a beautiful name? And you don't hear that in Jewish circles anymore, but it's gorgeous. Uh, okay. Finally, the oldest daughter, Yocheved, married Rabbi Meir ben Samuel, Kali, Kalionimus. Kalonimus, yeah. Kalonimus. Kalonimus means, actually, that is a, 
Kolonimos is a, is a Greek name. So that was a Greek family. And we've seen the Kolonimos family when we spoke, I think about, maybe not, but uh, it, it could have come up uh, when we spoke about Byzantine Jews in the south of uh, Italy. Now, we had a lot of influence on Italian Jews and maybe I haven't explained that, but Italian Jews, the Romans, the Romans in Italy, right, went up north uh, into Germany along the Rhine. That's where a lot of important uh, Roman settlements were. And so with the, these Roman settlements went Italian Jews. And I believe that is the origin of uh, Ashkenazi, i.e. German Judaism from, with the, these Roman settlements. So uh, that's also a reason, I think, an explanation for why I look at the, the slide before. Alvina, that's like, isn't that like, it sounds Italian, right? A lot of these names are Italian. There's even a, a Jewish, a male name, a boy's name uh, a Yidd in Yiddish. Uh, was called Ancho, which comes from Angelo. Well, it's absolutely, and there's uh, some, like Yiddish is a, is a, Germ, a Jewish dialect of German, but it ha the oldest words of, uh, of Yiddish are also, some of them are from Italian background. I don't know, some people might know the word bench. Bench is to say grace after meal. That comes from the Hebrew, from the Italian word to bless, benedicere. And then there are other words, um, in any case, I just love these, uh, these names, but Kalonimos is a, is a name from, from a Greek name, a Byzantine name that, uh, that of a big family, important family, also that lived in the south of, of Italy. Why am I saying this? Because I like to talk and I like history and I like to explain everything and I probably tell too much, but maybe some of you like it. I don't know. I hope so. Here you go. Hannah married Rabbi Samuel Ben Simha of Dampier and they had a son, Isaac. This son, Rabbi Isaac of Dampier, would also become celebrated, a celebrated Tosafist, best known as the R.I. The Re, okay. Yeah, the re. no problem. <laughs> yeah. Yocheved and Rabbi... It's actually, if you want to know, but it's, I, I don't care. But it's fun. It's totally wonderful. But if you want to know, it's actually Yocheved. Yocheved. Very good. I mean, you're good at it. Yeah. Thank you. Yocheved and Rabbi Meir also had three sons, Shemuel, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Yeah, isn't that something? Tongue twisters, right? <laughs> yeah, these three sons. Mm -hmm. The second son, Yitzhak, Isaac, later um, from born in 1090 and... I that's suppose, okay, that's okay. Later known as um, Rebam or the, the Rebam. or the Rebam. Uh -huh. Rebam died rather young and left behind seven orphans. Nonetheless, he wrote several Tosafot. The oldest son, Shemuel, became the head of the yeshiva of Troyes after his grandfather, Rashi, passed away. He wrote important Bible commentaries and additions to Rashi's Talmud commentaries. After his death, he became known under the acronym of Rashbam, yeah. Rabbi, Rabbi, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah no, yeah, that's, that's perfect, it's really good. Um, you're doing so well, so I'm giving you just a few more slides, if that's okay. okay thanks. The first Tosafot were written by Rashi's two son-in-laws. However, their Tosafot were not preserved, but only quoted by others. The actual fathers of Tosafot in France were undoubtedly Rashi's grandsons, Samuel and Jacob, better known as Rashbam and Rabinu Tam. Very good. And I will, we'll make this the last one. We already saw what the Rashbam said about Rashi's Bible commentary. Our rabbi, Shalomo Rashi, my mother's father who enlightened the eyes of the diaspora, wrote commentaries on the Torah, the prophets, and the other holy scriptures. He set out to explain the plain meaning of scripture. However, I, Shemuel, the son of his son-in-law, Rabbi Meir, made the memory of the righteous be a blessing, argued with him in person, and he admitted to me that if only he had the time, he would need to write a new, revi new revised commentaries based on insights into the plain meaning of scripture, which are discovered every day. Yeah, we, we mentioned that in the last class also, uh, briefly, that um, his intention was to give, uh, the, the, the tendency of the time was, uh, for uh, a period of time, was to, um, to, to leave behind uh, commentaries in the form of, stories and anecdotes, which are called midrash. It's actually uh, not an important term. And I, I've, I mentioned it last class. And to, and to move more towards um, 
a explanation of the text based on what actually the text says and not to bring outside sources in and outside, uh, let's say, other outside ideas. In the, so um, Rajbam was very much in favor of that. And um, you, as you will see, but so uh, my, R Rashi actually said, well, I started out doing that. Maybe I did it more than people before him. Maybe he brought out more textual uh, explanations than people before him, but definitely not in a, um, in a, in a, in a radical, uh, consistent way. Thank you so much, Samantha. I think Vanisha is here. Yeah, hello. Hello, Vanisha, that's nice. Hi. Good, go ahead. Um, not surprisingly, the Rosh bomb himself focused more, much more on a strictly literal interpretation. A focus on the literal interpretation of the text detached from allegory, tradition, and theology, but instead with intention for linguistics and context, was also a movement in Christian circles during that same period, the 12th century. In his commentary, Rashbaum mentions on several occasions his discussions with Christian scholars. Um, let the wise understand that every word and interpretation of our sages is correct and true. And so it is written in Tractate Shabbat. I was 18 years old and I had studied the entire Talmud, but I never realized that a verse in scripture never departs from its plain meaning. The why seems to be code word for rational thinkers. Yeah, rational thinkers or rationality. That was actually an influence from, uh, from Spain. Well, you know that in Spain they were into philosophy and into uh, uh, Greek, but of course, um, yeah, so he, what does that mean? Uh, a verse in scripture never departs from its plain meaning, how he explained it and, and other people of his time. You can have all these fanciful explanations about the text, but the core is always the plain meaning, the, the meaning of the text itself as it's written. In Jewish circles, it's called Prashat, for those who uh, it helps to understand what I'm talking about. That is always the core meaning. There will never... Be, but but the other meanings are nice and good, but they're on top of it. They're like they're like the the whipped cream on the cake. But the cake itself is always the plain meaning. Oh wait, here we go. Yeah. Um, Rashbam produced new explanations of the text that ignore existing mid-Rashic explanations and that are characterized by logical thinking. For instance, Exodus fifteen twenty to twenty one reads, "Then Miriam the prophet, Nebia." Aaron's sister took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women followed her with her, her with timbrels and dancing. Miriam sang to them, "Sing to the Lord, for He is highly exalted." Exalted, Both, exalted. Oh, exalted! Both horse and driver, He has hurled into the sea. Mm -hmm. Most commentators have struggled with the question why Miriam was called a prophet, a prophetess, prophetess. Uh -huh. even though it was never mentioned that she received. Prophecy. Yeah, so there are there are interesting stories about that here, for instance. Rashi had addressed this problem by relying on Midrash that Miriam had prophesied that her mother would give birth to a unique son, Moses. But this information is not in the text. It would give a great uh, explanation, but it's not in the text. So Rashbam says, let's uh, let's let's look at the text uh, instead. Instead, Rashbaum explains that the word nevia does not, does not necessarily mean prophetess, but describing anyone involved in praising God. And this is exactly what Miriam does in this passage, where she praises God for creating a path through the sea. Based on the same word in Arabic, I believe it means someone who proclaims God. Yeah, so because of, uh, of my linguistic knowledge, uh, naba uh, is a is a verb is a verb in Arabic, which means more like proclaiming. But it's the same thing. It's the same, really, praising God and proclaiming Him in this context, at least, uh, would be a very good uh, explanation. Yes, another example. Um, in Exodus three twenty, God tells Moses to go and take the Israel the Israelites out of Egypt. Mm -hmm. Now the cry of the Israelites. Um, has reached me, and I have seen how the Egyptians oppressed them. Therefore, come, I will send you to Pharaoh, and you shall free my people, the Israelites from Egypt. 
In the next verse, Moses responds, who am I to go to Pharaoh and free the Israelites from Egypt? Yeah, now it's kind of interesting what he says about this. I have a question. Sorry. Yes. How is Miriam connected to Rashi? Miriam? Yeah. You like mean the Miriam the prophetess? Yeah. Oh no, he just uh, he just he comments on the whole Bible. So there's a text. Oh. There's a text that. Um, well, I, I thought that for a second that you meant his daughter Miriam, but uh, no. There's a text that Miriam is called the prophetess, and he comes with uh, an explanation. So the question is, why is she a prophetess? So he only comments on that and gives an explanation. That's all. Okay, got it. These are ex examples of Bible commentaries, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, the Rashbam writes. Anyone who wants to understand the essential meaning of these verses in context must pay close, close attention to the explanation I am about to give. For my predecessors have not understood it one bit. So isn't that something? He said, anyone who wrote the commentary on this particular thing, that Moses asked the questions, who am I to go to Pharaoh and free the Israelites from Egypt? Hasn't, no one has understood it before, before me. So he's talking even about Rashi, but others is kind of presumptuous. No one understood one bit of it. Well, so how does he explain it? Um, Moses' double reply was related to the two things that the Holy One had said to him. One, that he should go to Pharaoh, and two, that he should free the Israelites. Moses replied to each in turn. First, who am I to go to Pharaoh? A foreigner like me is not worthy to enter the king's court, not even to bring him an offering or a gift. And second, and free the Israelites from Egypt? Even if I could enter Pharaoh's presence under some other pretext, as far as freeing the Israelites goes, what could I say to Pharaoh that he would accept? Is Pharaoh foolish enough to listen to me and send a huge nation who are his slaves away for free from his land? Yeah, so basically he sees that parallel. He's, his question, his God's command is to, uh, consists of two, two parts and his question also of two parts and the two parts correlate with God's instruction, basically. And that's kind of really uh, the result of analyzing the text really carefully. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give you one more, and I'm very pleased, and then we'll go to someone else. Mm -hmm. The Rashbam proves himself a rationalist by referring to Derek Erez. Derek Erez, right. Um, Derek Erez, it literally means the way of the earth, and is used in different ways in um, in rabbinic writings, it can mean having a profession or having good manners or a secular education. The Rashbam uses the term for the way of nature. For instance, in Genesis 41 2, Pharaoh dreams of seven cows that emerge from the Nile and then grazed in the most, I mean, in the reed grass. Cows don't come out of rivers, and most commentators before him explain that this is a dream imagery. Um, However, Rashbam writes that this is Derek Arez, the way of nature. It is the way of nature that cows drink from a river in a group and then climb back up the riverbank to graze. Oh, it says there's nothing special. There's no hocus pocus about it. They come out of the river in this dream and it says as if from the bottom of the river. No, they were just drinking. This is, so it's a very rationalistic approach, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course, if you say they come from the river, you can come with deep deep meanings and, uh, and, and symbolisms, but uh, he's just a very uh, down-to-earth kind of a person. Lovely. Thank you so much, Venetia. Thank you. Brittany, you are here, I know. Brittany, are you available? Yes, yeah, sorry, sorry. My computer wasn't unmuting. Oh, good. Well, just the space bar will do it also. I, I told that right before, but that's okay. Let's yes. go to the next slide, uh, Brittany. Sure. Rashbam proves himself a rationalist par excellence in his approach to miracles. In Exodus 14.21, in the story of splitting of the sea, the Torah says, the Lord moved the sea with a strong east wind all night. Rashbam again brings up the notion of derech eres, God uses powerful natural winds to dry the land. Mm. So meaning natural winds. He's saying it's natural. It's not a supernatural. So uh, he will, yeah, I think there's something else here. Uh, maybe I did not write, oh no, didn't write it. But he says, you will find that uh, if, you, if you think uh, clearly, that 
all the miracles that God does, he will hardly ever overrule the laws of nature. Meaning he's, he created the laws of nature. Why would he overrule them if it's not necessary? He uses natural natural uh, causes to, uh, to create a, something spectacular. He doesn't have to overrule uh, uh, logic. So that's, that's very, a very rational thing. So it's basically minimizing supernatural miracles. It's still a miracle if something happens, even in a, super, even in a natural way, it could still be seen as a miracle, like something remarkable. But let's say uh, you could say um, um, there is a, a rocket falls, in a dense neighborhood, right? It's, there's a war in the Middle East or something, and there's only one little square where nobody is at that moment, and the rocket falls exactly there. And you could say, well, that's, that's a miracle, but it still follows the laws of nature. There's nothing supernatural about it because there is always a chance that it falls anywhere. And it's because, but you could still see, see that the laws of nature are intact, but you could still see that things are a miracle. But that is. Uh, later, Maimonides and in a, in a future class is going to have the same approach. They're very similar in, in some ways. Now let's go to this slide. The youngest son of Yochaved and Rabbi Meir, younger brother of Rashbam, was Yaakov, Jacob. He would become one of the most influential Ashkenazi rabbis, a leading Tosafist and an authority of, on Jewish law. He is mostly known as Rabbi Tam. Yeah. Younger siblings sometimes want to prove themselves by outsmarting their older siblings and going off the beaten path. In some ways, Rabbeinu Tam did just that, as you will see shortly. The Rabbeinu Tam is known for some original and divergent opinions. The first one concerns the phylact phylacteries. Phylacteries, that's a, just an unusual, <laughs> so funny, like... Uh... Uh, phylacteries is an English word for tefillin, and people say, oh, maybe people don't know what tefillin is, but phylacteries, nobody knows what that is either. <laughs> but in any case, that is the English word, okay? Phylacteries of the head. The tefillin of the head contains four Torah fragments written on four separate pieces of parchment. The tefillin on the, of the hand contains the same four sections, but written on one singular piece of parchment. Yeah. So these are, now we're going to look at which... Which texts are in the tefillin? The first one. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, sanctify to me all the firstborn, both of the people of it and of the animals, they are mine. Moses said to the people, remember this day when you came out from Egypt, out of slavery, for by the strength of his hand did the Lord bring you out of, his, out of this place. No leavened bread shall be eaten. Seven days shall you eat unleavened bread. You shall tell your child on that day, this is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. It shall be a sign. It shall be for a sign for your, for you upon your hand mm. as a reminder mm. between your eyes that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand did the Lord take you out of Egypt. Yeah, because it says it shall be and a typo. Sorry, it shall be a sign for you upon your hand and a reminder between your eyes. That's exactly exactly. Look at this slide. What the uh, you see on the left? What does the feeling are? It's on your hand. And it's on your uh, arm, so or, or on your hand and on your, and between your eyes, or meaning on your forehead. That uh, that's why this text is included in the tefillin. The second text. It will be when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, as He swore to you and to your fathers. When he, and when He gives it to you, you shall set apart to the Lord all that opens the womb. Every firstborn animal shall be the Lord's. And all the firstborn of man among your sons shall you redeem. And when your son asks you in the future, what is this? Answer him with a strong hand. The Lord took us out of Egypt, out from slavery. Yeah, Without you can skip a bit. Just go to the underlined uh, verse on the bottom. Oh, it shall be for a sign upon your hand and a reminder between your eyes. For with a strong hand did the Lord take us out of Egypt. So you could say this is basically the same text because this is Exodus first. 1 to 10, and this is 11 through 16. It's the same chapter, and it's on the same topic, but it's mentioned twice, so we have two parts now already. Uh, in the in the feeling, this whole section is bound, a sign on the hand and a reminder between the eyes. The third one is the most famous one, of course. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart 
and with all your soul and with all your might. These words, which I command you this day, shall be upon your heart. Teach them thoroughly to your children and speak of them when you sit in your house and when you walk on the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as a sign upon your hand and let them be a reminder between your eyes. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Once again, it says of this text, it is a whole different section of the Torah. Tie them as a sign on your hand and let them be a reminder between your eyes. So this one also goes in the tefillin. And the last one, I'm sorry, but we can, we will skip it a bit. We'll just, uh, just do one, one sentence till the first period and then go to the, to the underlined line. That'll be fine. It will be when you listen to my commandments that I command you today to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. Then I will give you the rain for your land in its season, the early and the late rain. Yeah, you can go further down now. Tie them as a sign on your hand and they shall be a reminder between your eyes. Yeah, so this one also. Those are the four texts. So the first one starts with sanctify me to me all the firstborn. Second one, it will be when the Lord brings you. Third, hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And four, it will be when you listen. Uh, so those are the four, uh, the four texts. Hold on. So here they are. Um, in Hebrew, uh, it has the first words, but in English, A, sanctify to me. B, it will be when the Lord brings you. C, hear, O Israel. D, it will be when you listen. Could you read the, the, for the top lines? Sure. There are discussions about the order in which these fragments should be inserted in the tefillin. Rashi and pretty much everyone else teaches that they should be arranged according to the order in which they appear in the Torah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Like This is exactly the order in which they appear in the Torah, so that's how they are put in. Uh, and that's based on a, on, on a Talmud uh, text. But Rashi's grandson, the Rebbeinu Tam, teaches a different order. He says, basically, the first one was A, B, C, D. He teaches A, B, D, C. So, it's a little different. Now, why is that? Just wants to be different? Or it has a reason? We will look at the discussion in the Talmud and how Rabbeinu Tam uh, interprets it. I, I will give you... Well, you know what? You read so much already, no? Are you still uh, still um, enjoying the reading or no? I can read more if you want. Okay. The Babylonian Talmud, Tracti Menohat 34b. Menachot. The, rabbi, right. okay. the rabbis taught how, in, how is the sequence of the fragments. A, sanctify me, and B, it will be when the Lord brings you on the right. C, hear, O Israel, and D, it will be when you listen on the left. But the opposite was taught. Abaye solved this by saying that is not difficult to explain. According to our source, it is described according to someone who faces the person who wears the tefillin. But the other source describes it according to the one who wears it. The person who faces the person who wears the tefillin reads the fragment in their order. So there is another source <clears throat> in the Talmud where it says not A, B, C, D, but D, C, B, A, or and, and so... Um, would say A and B on the left and C and D on the right, but that depends. Is it for me? Is it like A, B, C, D for me when I'm wearing it? Or is it for somebody who looks? So that, of course, makes a difference. What does Rashi say? Rashi interprets the Talmud as stating that the individual passages in the tefillin are placed in their biblical order. The person who faces the tefillin wearer reads the fragments in their order means in the order in which they are written in the Torah. Yeah, and you see it's from right to left because Hebrew is written from right to left. So A on the right, B uh, and B, and then C and D is on the left half of the tefillin as it is, well, that's what it said there before, yeah? So one is left, say A and B on the right and C and D on the left. But on the left and on the right, that is, uh, why doesn't it say, a, B, C, D, from right to left. Why does it say two on the right and two on the left? That's where the problem comes in for Rabbeinu Tam. In his commentary, he writes, The person who faces the tefillin where reads the fragments in their order. Rabbeinu Tam had a problem with Rashi's interpretations of this line. Because why are they split? So that if someone, so that if someone reads the first two on the right and the other two on the left. Rabbeinu Tam explains as follows. A, sanctify me, and B, it will be when the Lord brings you. 
is read from the right of for the person facing the one who wears the tefillin, and C and D is read from the left for the person who wears the tefillin. In that way, the split into right and left makes sense. So not on the right and on the left, but from the right and from the left. That's how he interprets. So now you have A, B, D, C. See that? Uh, it's just a bit um, thinking quite deeply and coming with uh, more uh, less simple, uh, it's less, it's a less um, obvious explanation. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Rabbeinu Tam appears to have been a bold thinker who determined Jewish law by interpreting the Talmud in his own independent way, even if the, this meant going against established tradition, including the view of his revered, revered grandfather. Some Jewish men put on two pairs of tefillin. First, at the beginning of the morning prayer, they put on Rashi tefillin, and towards the end of the service, they take it off and put on Rabbeinu Tam tefillin. Yeah, yeah, isn't that something? Just to cover all your bases. Some even wear both pairs at the same time. Yeah, isn't that something? None, neither Rashi nor Rabbeinu Tam said you put on both. <laughs> Rashi said, only do uh, what everybody else does. And Rabbi Mutam says, no, that's wrong. Put on mine. But nobody said to put on both. So in my opinion, then you're not following really either uh, in any case. Thank you so much. It was lovely. It was great. Then we're going to Amy. Yeah, I'm here. Amy, I'm happy to hear you. We'll mm -hmm. continue the, this class with you. Okay. Another divergent approach to Jewish law has to do with Rabbeinu Tam's take on cosmology. In antiquity and during the Middle Ages, the sky was believed to be a dome-shaped firmament, which was spanned over the flat earth. The sun, the moon, and the stars were perceived to be attached to this firmament. Yeah. In the cosmology of the time, there was water above the firmament. Of course, this is not such a strange thought. The water of the ocean is blue and the sky is blue too. So it seems natural to assume that there is water above as well. And if there is, something must prevent it from coming down, the firmament. A dome-shaped firmament is also a logical assumption. The blue sky is high above us, but also touches the horizon in every direction. So it looks like it's right. It looks like it goes around. Here on the left, you see a uh, schedule of the firmament and then the earth and below the earth, Sheol, which means the underworld and the waters of the deep are below the earth. Continue. Underneath the surface of the earth was the underworld, Sheol, the abode of the dead. Yeah. The Talmud contains discussions and various opinions about the thickness of the firmament and about the questions where the sun, moon, and stars travel after they set, after they reach uh, the end of their journey along the firmament. There were two opinions. Either the sun travels in a circle and continues below the earth during the night, or it makes a U-turn and travels back along the outside above the firmament. Yeah, if the firmament is really thick, you might not see it. There was actually some people thought, uh, I'm not sure in the Middle Ages, but in antiquity, that uh, the stars are not really suns or planets, uh, or lamps even. They're just little holes in the firmament. And at night, when the sun is on the other side, the, the light of the sun shines through these little holes, and those are the stars. That was one theory also. It's hard to imagine now, right? Because you know so much more about in those days, you try to make sense of what you see. Um, okay. Uh huh. There is even an opinion that one should not make matzahs mm -hmm. for Passover with water that is drawn from a well after sunset. The fear was that maybe the sun below the earth had warmed up the water, which could cause the wheat flour to rise, and this would make matzahs unfit for Passover. Yeah, you don't feel it, but uh, maybe it's somehow warm. Rabbi Tom believed that the sun traveled above the firmament, but he had an interesting reasoning. Since no one can see the sun turning, obviously it made its turn somewhere below the horizon. He deducted from this that the firmament must reach below the horizon. So it As goes here. You see it above the earth. That's the lower uh, circle. Then it goes lower below the, the water, below the, the horizon. And then it turns and it continues on the outside of the firmament. But what does that mean? As a result, it must take the sun a bit of time after sunset to travel around the edge of the firmament. According to the Jewish calendar, days start and end at sunset. However, Rebbe Tom, Tom now concluded that the turn of the sun a while after sunset was the time that constituted the beginning and the end of the days. That meant that he and his students would start Shabbat later than others and also 
ended Shabbat considerably later. Some people today still follow the opinion of Rabbi Tom in this matter, but only for the latter, for the later end of Shabbat, not for the beginning. No, because that would mean the sun will be all down, everybody's keeping Shabbat, but they would not. Nobody goes that far because we know that it was all based on a, uh, on, a, on, a, on a false assumption about the sun. But some people still want to honor him by keeping the strictness at the end of Shabbat by waiting longer. I guess it can never be... Some people try to be... have a tendency towards strictness. That's uh, okay. Yeah, that was... Uh, I think that's interesting. Yeah, next. Another influential Tosafist was Rabbi Yosef, Yosef ben Yitza of... Orleans. 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 Or you can say Orleans if you want, but uh, yeah, New Orleans is named after Orleans. Who is better known under his nickname Behor Shor? Yeah, you, 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 you get the, you understand my trans, transliteration. Yeah, Behor Shor, correct. A student of Rabbi Tom, the Behor Shor lived during the 12th century, the time of the Second Crusade. Yeah. While the First Crusade had by and large hit the Jewish communities in the Rhineland, Germany hard, it had spared the communities in France. Now, during the Second Crusade, 1147 to 1150, several French communities were massacred. Right, and um, we'll do just a few more. Okay. The Third Crusade, 1189 to 1192, did not see any killing of Jews in France. However, when William of Normandy had conquered England in 1066, hence his nickname, William the Conqueror, he had attracted French Jews to move to England with him and provide him with financial services. Gradually, a growing number of French Jews had moved to England. Unfortunately, the time of the Third Crusade was also the beginning of a wave of anti-Semitic massacres. Two colleagues of Behor Shore, both students of Rabbi Tom, were among those killed. Yeah. Um, we'll do this, the last one. Okay. During this period, the situation of the Jews in France progressively deteriorated. Um, they were gradually banned from commerce, leaving money lending the only source of income that remained. As a result, Jews charging interest from needy Christians put even more oil in, on the fire of anti-Semitism. Yeah, nobody lo likes a, a banker who was knocking at your door and say, if you can't pay, I'm going to take your couch or your bed or stuff. That, that, doesn't, uh, that never makes you popular. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Christina, are you available? Yeah. Hey, Christina, would you like to read a bit? Being a rationalist, the Bekor Shore had a similar approach to scripture as the Rashbam, often bringing down to earth interpretations. In Genesis, we read the story about the sons of Jacob who hated their brother Joseph to the point that they wanted to kill him. <laughs> the oldest, Reuben, convinced him not to spill his blood, but to throw him into a pit instead at the same time planning to save him when the moment would occur. The Torah tells, and Reuben returned to the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit. Genesis thirty seven twenty nine. The implication here is that Reuben had gone away and did not know what had happened in the meantime. Spoiler, Joseph was sold into slavery. Yeah, you can read the story for yourself, but that is what happened. Yeah? The question is, where had Reuben gone and why had he left his brothers? Rashi had brought up the old mid Midrash that Reuben had visited his father to look after him. The core shore, however, brings up a practical objection. The brothers were in she Shechem. Shechem. You can say Nablus. Uh -huh. Nablus, while Jacob was in Hebron. So you see here the, see here the, um, the map um, on Google Maps. Hebron is in the south and Nablus is in the north, you see? Mm -hmm. Bekor Shor did not have Google Maps, but he knew that it is, that, that is quite a distance. 25 hours of straight walking, not easy to pay anyone a quick visit. So that would have mean, look, you cannot walk in the night in those days. There's no light and it's very dangerous and they're white animals, uh, wild animals. Then uh, also there you have um, the heat of the day. You have to take a rest. You have to uh, uh, eat and drink and stuff like that. So it would take a few days probably to get there if you walked past, for, I would say, two or three days and, um, and back to. So it would be a whole week. So that um, doesn't fit in the story. It seems like more that Ruben had been away for, for a bit, but not for a whole week. 
right okay but car short brings a practical practical alternative based on common custom it is the rec harom the way of shepherds that while some eat some else someone else goes and watches the sheep he suggests that Reuben had been watching the sheep while his brothers, who had been eating, sold jo Joseph into slavery. That is why Reuben was unaware of what had happened. Yeah, that's once again just a more natural, uh, more um, logical explanation. Okay, very nice. Mm -hmm. The Korshor also looks for rational explanations for the commandments. When he comments on Exodus 15:26. If you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. He explains that when we keep the commandments, God uses the laws of nature to keep us healthy. One way that happens is we will not eat the forbidden foods that are prohibited because they are unhealthy. So that, no one else says that. Uh, I know in Islam, for instance, a lot of people will say, well, if you eat halal, that is healthy, and that's why it's forbidden. In Judaism, most people will say um, they will bring out that there's many people who eat forbidden foods um, for Judaism. Let's say here you see oysters, lobsters, uh, uh, shrimp, and uh, crab and stuff. Those are one of, some of the forbidden foods. People will say there's many people who eat it and they're perfectly healthy, uh, but we, most people will say we only do it because God told us not to eat it. But um, this is not uh, not because of um, of necessarily of health, uh, maybe spiritual health. Who knows? We don't know. Uh, but he actually says it's very interesting that it is that it is for health, uh, and so he is uh, quite um, a minority opinion. But it's very interesting. I mean. I'm not saying either or, which is true or not, but only observing what people have said. Right, okay, yeah. When discussing the sin offering, the Korshors offers a psychological perspective. The sin offering itself does not take away sins, but it gives sinners a sense that they can receive a clean bill of spiritual health. This encourages them not to repeat the sin. Yeah, so he's, not, he's saying, look, the sin itself doesn't take away. It's not the... It's not magic. So uh, if it's not magic, so because if I, I let's say I've, I've done something wrong, right? To God, maybe I cursed or I, whatever. I, I, I didn't listen to my conscience or I, whatever. It could be so many things. And um, would, why would I become a better person mechanically by killing a, pit, a dove or something? Yeah, that's, and, and sacrificing it. Does that take away my sin? No, he says, if you see, if you, you, this action is an expression of um, making up for something, doing something in return, you, um, you have a feeling that God gives you an option to do something. And it's, it's only to, to kindle the awareness that God will give you um, a, a, a clean slate if you, uh, if you repent and if you want to be a better person. But the thing itself would not uh, would not do much it's more the psychological process behind it yes the car shores really proves himself a rationalist in his approach to miracles in general he tries to explain them in natural terms you will find in respect to most miracles that god does not change the course of nature For he calls that minhag olam which means uh, uh, the custom of the world that's his term so everybody uses a different term, uh, which makes it a bit complicated sometimes when you want to study these people because it's not, there's no consistency in terminology necessarily, but that's what it is. Mm -hmm. For example, when Lot's wife turned into a pillar of salt, when she looked back at the city of Sodom that was being destroyed by burning sulfur, this was not a miraculous act of God, but it was because she procrastinated. In other words, she was not sufficiently distant. He didn't stay at a safe distance and therefore, let's say being close to radiation or to, uh, to anything else, who knows what it was, but he said it was more like a natural thing. God would not do this overriding the laws of nature to punish her, to make her into a pillar of salt. It's uh, probably a metaphor for that she 
was affected by the by by what was happening in the in the city. Yeah. The Bakor Shore was the last of the rationalist Tosafids. Starting in the 13th century, the Tosafids after him would rather gather and re reiterate the interpretations of earlier commentators. Additionally, the later Tosafids were more interested in Midrash than in the literal meaning of the text. They would also start incorporating more mystical interpretation. Yeah, so this actually, this movement towards uh, rationalism in Ashkenaz, in the Ashkenazi in Germany, in Northern France, um, was not so long, was, a few, uh, was just a few um, generations. And then it went back to more traditionalistic uh, way. Because the rationalists are um, constantly looking, well, for rational explanations. And rac rational explanations, they change with the time because what we find rational uh, in the 16th century is what they thought was rational then. It's not rational now. I'll give you an example. In these days, people thought that, uh, many people thought that astrology uh, was a science. So if you study the, the constellations of the stars and um, what the movements are and how they relate to each other, the idea that you can predict things uh, and, um, or can explain personality traits and, and things like that, um, that appeared to people more like a science because you can actually make calculations and it's not based on, so not so much, it doesn't have to be so much based on intuition or on personal subjective uh, ideas. So uh, a true astrologer, a careful astrologer would just say, this is where this star is, and this means this. Of course, uh, the, the, the way to interpret and to, it might not, it's not scientific for us, right? Because uh, we think maybe it's pseudoscience, doesn't mean that there is no, some people still think there's truth in it, and I'm the last one to, to criticize that. Um, but in terms of science, in the modern sense of the world, science is something that you can, that has been tested through experimentation and confirmed and with, uh, uh, with, with an, uh, and, and confirmed again. And, and um, yeah, so that is, that is not science. Um, well, we know, for instance, we do, we, if something happens that coincides with the uh, prediction of astrology, there's no scientific way to explain that. Uh, and, some, and often enough, it does not. On the other hand, we understand scientifically how uh, gravity works. That we have in the meantime. So if I have a pen here and I will let it go, um, I can predict that it will go down, and my prediction was correct. It, it went down. That's uh, that, and so that is. We know why yeah, now. They didn't know why in those days, but that we that is scientific. So as I said, people had uh, considered in these days uh, astrology to be a type of science, and therefore they might explain certain things in the Bible with the help of astrology. Maybe, um, maybe the Shabbat, the seventh day of the week, is, taken for the, is given to the Jews because of the energy of that day is, pro, is maybe not good to work or it's good to rest or all these things. So that in their idea, that was a rationalistic, in those days, a rationalistic uh, scientific explanation of a text. Now we wouldn't think that is, right? So what I'm saying is rationalism changes with the insights of science and of our rationality, what we consider rational. Um, so, so for a rational approach, you have to constantly say, ah, this was actually wrong, now we know a little better. Uh, so that's one of the parts that people are turned off to, like you explaining, you're using reason and rationality to explain these things, but every time you're debunked and you have to come up with another explanation. So that is a weak, a weak of course, a weak part of, um, of, of scientific uh, approach. On the other hand, if you use a Midrashic approach, like uh, just allegorical stories, um, if you take that literally, well, then you are in deep trouble, but then you're probably not even open to science in the first place. 
Or, but if you see it as a metaphor, metaphors are fine. You know, metaphors are good. Metaphors don't have to change because they're not testable by science in the first place. All right, let's continue. Uh, we'll take somebody else for the last few slides. I thank you uh, profoundly um, for, for reading. And um, let's go to who else is here? Is Nayeli here? I'm here. So. Nayeli? Yes. Hi, hello. Hello, Professor. Okay, um, go ahead. Interesting here, so we can see a parallel development within Christian Europe. Christians started to revert to a more spiritual, less literally interpreted of scripture, interpretation of scripture. Yeah, so at the time when Jews were into literal, uh, rational interpretation of the text, Christians at the same time were too. And, and after a while, that was satiated. Maybe there was a dead end road. And maybe so. And then they went back to more, more or less uh, literal ways, both together. So this is what I, I mentioned, zeitgeist. Remember, uh, we were, used the word zeitgeist. Some people knew what the word meant. Some people not. Something is in the air. There's a culture change. And the culture change goes through, uh, will happen. Yeah. Um, will happen, how do you say? Not really, it's not really split by the boundaries of religions or communities. So um, you have in our days too, when, there's a, uh, when there is a wave of fundamentalism uh, in, in thinking, you will see that in Judaism, in Christianity, in Islam, in these movements, and even in politics. And when there's a, a, a when, the, when these are often coming in waves, when there's a, a movement of open-mindedness, then you will also see that in different societies uh, at the same time. That's what the zeitgeist, the, the spirit of the time that was happening in those days. So we went back to less literalistic uh, ways. Yes. In the Talmud commentaries, the writings of the to Tosafists are often quite hard to understand. The most entangled discussions are treated as though they were simple. The Tosafists did not write a continuous commentary, but dealt, it, dealt uh, only with difficult passages of the Tom Talmudic text. Yeah, Talmudic text, right. Um, so it's not so easy. Mm -hmm. Single sentences are often explained by quotations from other Talmudic treaties, treatises. Treatises, treatises, yeah. That seemed at first glance to have no connection with the sentence in question. In question, on the other hand, sentences which seem to be related and in interdependent are often separated and explained in different contexts. Explanations of words or grammar are rare. Yeah, studying is really a brain twister. That's, uh, yeah. The most important center of Tosfa literature was without any doubt Northern France, for it began with Ra Rashi's students and was continued mainly by the heads of French Talmud schools. Of course, this came to an end when the Jews were expelled from France, first in 1306, re-admitted in 1315, finally expelled in 1394. At the same time as in France, there were also Tosafists active in Germany and later in England and even in Spain. The French, the French Tosafists were, however, dominant. Here is a typical printed page of the Talmud. The starting point is the Mish Mishnah, here marked in red. The actual discussion is the Hemra, Gemara, here, Gemara. Hemra, here marked in yellow, which often goes on for many pages. Rashi's commentary is shown here in blue. It is always printed in the margin on the inside of the page. On the opposite side are commentaries by the Tosafists here in green. Yeah, see, there's a lot of them. This is almost the biggest part. Tosafa are printed in almost all Talmud editions. However, the collection that is printed in the Talmud 
which is called the Tosafa Shal Shan Shalanu. Shalanu. Shalanu is by far not the only collection of the Tosafa. Jewish scholars in Muslim lands saw the lengthy and complicated discussions in the Talmud as merely a stage towards deciding the final rulings of Jewish law. This is, a, this is actually an important, uh, an important page. So um, maybe read it again so it seeps in a bit. It's, uh, say the, read this again. Jewish scholars in Muslim lands saw the length, lengthy and complicated discussions in the Talmud as merely a stage towards deciding the final ruling of Jewish law. Study, studying these Talmud, Talmudic discussions were not seen as a goal on its own. Yeah, so uh, they would study it, but they study it for the laws. Now, the laws later are written down separately because the Talmud is just a lot of discussions, mostly. And there are laws, but it's not so clear to find the laws. But there are some pieces where the laws and, uh, are clear. So before there were like compendiums of laws distilled out of the Talmud, as you will see shortly, that's, uh, that's going to come. That was a, a new stage. And that started with Jews from Muslim lands. They say, you know, let's get these laws that we want to know from the, these discussions. And we'll write them down. And then we, finally we have everything. So this discussion was, like, was seen as a, as a process. But uh, so in Muslim lands, they, they studied it just to focus on this, this part, that part with, let's say, with, with, with students, not so much for to, to understand the discussion and the, this discussion. No, more for the outcome of the discussion. In contrast, <coughs> did you read this already? Sorry. In contrast, in Ashkenazi communities, Studying and analyzing these discussions became the ultimate spiritual exercise. Yeah, so it's, those are very complicated, uh, complicated uh, discussions. But just to figure out all these discussions and to know them and who says who and what refers to what, uh, became, um, that became, uh, and that's an Ashkenazi um, uh, approach. It wasn't Sephardic, now this becomes, this is now often seen as the ultimate uh, experience of Judaism in, in, in many circles of, uh, of Orthodox Judaism, but um, that wasn't always the case. That started here, basically. <clears throat> uh, of course, um, it's, it's, it's a huge brain trainer because you have to keep track of so many different trains of thought and, um, and, and different ways of, whole different ways of thinking as, 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 as modern thinking. <clears throat> so, um, if over the generations you train everybody's brain to do this, in certain families at least, um, it is maybe, some people say it's connected to the fact that uh, disproportionately uh, scholars and, um, uh, and, and people who won the, how do you call the, 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 the Nobel Prize winners, disproportionately are Ashkenazi Jews because they have been basically selecting <laughs> based on brain. Uh, so the people with the, the, the biggest brain, the most, uh, the best scholars, uh, were the first one to marry off. And there's always a part that never gets married. And those were the people who couldn't study so much. So you're actually training, you're actually selecting your offspring based on brain function in a way, strangely enough. Other communities who do it based on successful trading. There are societies where that happens based on if you're uh, Fiercest warrior, so the, the 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 biggest warriors in certain tribal societies who killed the most enemies, they would be get getting uh, the most wives and most offspring. But here it was the brain. Now it comes with, uh, yeah, that it might come with uh, with a price. Everything comes with a price, but uh, because you know it's 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 a very it's a it's a somewhat of a limited uh, focus. But so I think that's what happened. Here's the last slide already. Studying Talmud became a way to connect with God. Adding new commentaries and insights to the study of Talmud was therefore highly prestigious. People who have studied Talmud for, year, for many years and have gathered deep knowledge of it are often believed to have reached the intuitive knowledge of God's will to the point that they can give you advice to every aspect of your life. Yeah, so this is, a, as I said, you have, <clears throat> you have uh, 
uh, Jews from Arab lands, uh, from Islamic lands, and Jews from Christian lands. Um, sometimes they're called Sephardic versus Ashkenazic, but Sephardic, uh, not really true, because Sephardic eventually also ended up in Christian lands, so it's a different culture. But so in, in Islamic lands, as we saw in, in, Andal in Al Andalus, um, it, it was the ideal was to develop in a rounded mo uh, way and most broad as possible. So you would all, everybody would, who would be a celebrated scholar of Judaism would also study astronomy, uh, would also study medicine, would also study math, math would also study philosophy, would also write poetry, uh, would know grammar, all these things are, were all seen as, as just as important because they're all um, a reflection or a part of God's creation and therefore just as, part, just as a reflection of God's will as the Bible or the Talmud. So it's basically also studying the universe is also, and math is also studying Torah, basically. It's, it's the same thing. But in Ashkenazi world, it became soon enough, as we also see in a few classes from here, at the expense. So it was seen as dangerous to study secular studies because you would maybe be pulled away from uh, a Jewish, Jewish lifestyle. Uh, so that was, it's a very, very different culture. And so soon enough, we will see a culture clash between the Jews from Arab lands who uh, had to flee because of uh, the, some of the Islamic uh, uh, regimes becoming intolerant. They had to flee for their lives and they went to Christian lands, but they brought with them grammar and philosophy. And so there was a, then, then became the big culture clash basically because they, they said, oh, these, these Jews that we, in these new communities, Christian communities, they're so good at Talmud, it's amazing. But they take all these Midrash stories, allegorical stories, literally. That's just, that we have to teach them that. That is really not good. They, uh, they don't know grammar, well, we'll teach them that. They don't know philosophy, we'll teach them that. But the culture cl clash is too big. People were saying, what? It was, a, it was, a, it was a, a big clash. And we'll see that, uh, let's say, in a few weeks. So that's really interesting. I, this was initially, up to now, always half a class. It's uh, much shorter on Todd de Tosopis. I did it with a, combined with another class on the... Um, the German pietist, the Hasid Ashkenaz, is going to come later. I split him into, so um, I don't know. I could have maybe added a bit more material because there's a lot of things that have shaped Judaism, which are all a lot of them have uh, come from these Tosafists. So, huh? Yeah, but uh, we'll see. We'll see other stuff. So this is lovely. Are there any questions you want me to answer or discuss? Everything, everybody is happy. I'm going to look at your picture.